Uh, we can start now, Dr. Mary. Dr. Mary, you are on mute. Hello, good morning. I'm Mary Stephen from uh, WHO Afro. Welcome to WHO Afro Media Briefing, which is taking place in collaboration with the APO Group. Uh, before we proceed, we will do some quick housekeeping first. Um, just go to the um, lower bottom of your screen. On the right hand side, you will see the icon. So we have interpretation in English and French. Uh, feel free to select uh, whichever language you, uh, you prefer. Um, Francois, can you please uh, interpret in French? Bonjour et merci à tous d'être connectés pour ce point presse. Vous, uh, pour, pour poser des questions, merci d'utiliser la fonction questions et réponses de uh, Zoom qui est dans votre uh, barre d'outils. Et pour l'interprétation en français, vous pouvez cliquer sur l'outil d'interprétation, le petit globe, et choisir français. Merci à tous. Merci. Um, joining us from Brazzaville is uh, Dr. Mashidisio Moeti, the WHO Regional Director for Africa. Uh, please help me welcome Dr. Moeti, who will introduce the remaining past panelists. Okay. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mary, and uh, greetings to all our colleague journalists. Uh, bonjour à tous nos collègues journalistes, and also to everyone joining this press conference, particularly our colleagues from the APO group. Um, we will be talking today mainly about the new COVID-19 variants circulating in Africa and their impact and potential impact on the situation, including the surge in new cases. I'm very pleased to be joined by Professor Tulio de Oliveira, who is the director of uh, the CRISP at the National Mandela School of Medicine in South Africa, and uh, by Dr. Amadou Sal, who is the director of the Institut Pasteur in Senegal. In the past week, more than 175,000 new COVID-19 cases and 6,200 deaths have been reported on the African continent with countries, particularly in the Northern and the Southern part of Africa accounting for the biggest increases. Cumulatively, there are now almost 3.5 million cases and 88,000 lives unfortunately have been lost. So in the past week, we've had more than 175,000 new cases in, on the continent. So WHO is tracking the emergence of different variants of the COVID-19 virus and updating guidance and strategies as new information becomes available. We are seeing more and more cases of variant N501Y.V2, which was first identified in South Africa, now cropping up in other countries. So far, six African countries and areas have confirmed cases of this variant including Botswana, Ghana, Kenya, Mayotte, and Zambia. Beyond Africa, the variant has been confirmed in 24 countries globally, and there's concern it is circulating in other countries in Africa as yet undetected. So at WHO, we are working with countries to help them identify if this variant or others are circulating to safely transport samples to referral laboratories for sequencing and analysis. The variant of concern first identified in the United Kingdom has also made its way to Africa with confirmed cases in the Gambia. The evidence suggests that these variants are more transmissible and emerging evidence indicates that the UK variant may cause more severe illness than other common strains, although certainly more research needs to be done. Encouragingly, this week, at least two manufacturers have indicated that their vaccines are effective against both variants. In addition to the new variants, COVID-19 fatigue in the population and the aftermath of year-end gatherings and travel 
risk powering a perfect storm and driving up Africa's second wave and overwhelming health systems and facilities. It's important that all countries ramp up testing, isolation of contacts and treatment of patients, as well as the preventive measures such as minimizing large gatherings. At WHO, we're working very hard with countries to prepare for the delivery of COVID-19 vaccines. And we encourage all countries to continue to do their best to be ready to roll out these vaccines to communities once they are available. We particularly encourage the government of the United Republic of Tanzania to prepare for the vaccine, to put in place the preventive measures to protect their population and to share data on the COVID-19 situation with WHO and neighboring countries. Africa is at a crossroads and all Africans must double down on the prevention measures that work so well, physical distancing, frequent hand hygiene and the wearing of masks. I very much look forward to our conversation with uh, two experts and also with members of our team in WHO who will be ready to jump in and also respond to any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Moeti. Now we turn to uh, Prof. Prof. Uh, Tulio from South Africa. Could you shed some light on the latest finding of the new um, variant of COVID-19, which was first detected in South Africa? Okay, yeah, yeah, thank you. And, and good day to all our colleagues of the World Health Organization and colleagues across the world, yeah. Thank you for, for the invitation for this press release. Yeah. So in, in South Africa, as many of you will be aware, yeah, this, this variant, which, which the name is 501YV2 or the B1351, if one uses the other classification, the Pango, yeah, it has swept all through the country. Yeah. Uh, our last um, genomic surveillance from KwaZulu Natal and from all around the country, it showed that variant at very high prevalence. Yeah, normally more than 90% of the genomes that we produce, it is this variant. So, so it seemed that not only has spread very fast in the country, but uh, in many different provinces, dominating most of the infections. Yeah. So South Africa um, decided to, to act very quick and with transparency against this variant yeah, with both increasing the, the, the response yeah, and, and, and that also increased some of the restrictions within the country. And we, we have the signs that that has been quite effective so far, we, we see a very big decrease on number of cases and, and hospitalizations. However, our, our excess debt, it is now almost double as it was on the first wave, yeah. In relationship to the spread of this variant to, to other countries, yeah, we, 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 we at the moment, as, as highlighted in the start, it is spreading quite widely uh, around the world, yeah, it's it's depending how you count. We we count then two ways: counts that reported the variants and countries that sequence from the variant uh, available. Yeah, and if one look for the different ways to report, yeah, so 29 countries have reported the variant, but there is sequence available for 22 different counts around the world. Yeah. And in the African subcontinent, in the African continent, yeah, new countries have been reported the presence of this variant. Yeah, with the, yesterday the Minister of Minister of Health of Mozambique reporting that 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 the variant was also have have entered Mozambique. Yeah, and and Mozambique also had a fast increase of of, of cases since December. Yeah. We, we, we are currently working with, with a very big group of an, a network in South Africa to understand not only the spread of the lineage, but the implications of, of, of the biological implications. And in the last two weeks, yeah, we, we released some very important results in relationship to the neutralization of this variant by, by 
convalescent plasma of patients that were infected in the first wave here. Yeah. And the results were consistent both between our group and the African Health, uh, African Health Research Institute on live virus that showed that this, this variant is less neutralized, much less neutralized than the previous variant, but also by, by, by the team of the National Institute of Communicable Disease, led by Penny Moore, that did that on pseudovirus, showing also much lower neutralization by, by covalescent plasma, these antibodies from the previous infections, yeah. One piece of good news, it came that uh, the, the vaccines, they know normally elute much higher level of antibodies than primary infections, yeah. So, so we are still confident that the vaccines will be effective because in addition of the higher levels of antibodies, you also have the other part of the immune system, the T-cell response. And Mordena was the first one to release some results showing a slightly decrease on the neutralization from antibodies, but the vaccine is still effective. Of course, the, the, the Mordena uh, vaccine is not the most appropriate for the uh, African uh, continent due to the very low, low uh, cold chain that need of minus 80, but, but, but that, that despite that's quite good, good news to, to see that. Yeah. At the moment in South Africa, we, we are trying to work with, to answer another few very important questions. The one is this variant um, cause more reinfection than previous variants. And, and the other one, it is using the same pseudovirus and live virus experiment to see the neutralization with people that have been vaccinated yeah, as part of trials in the, in the African continent. Yeah. Uh, just to finalize, we also have set up a very important partnership with the Africa CDC and the World Health Organization through the Pathogen Genomic Initiative in the African continent. And we have, we, we have, we have selected half of our genomic throughput, yeah, so we, can, we, we will be able to offer all the African countries up to like uh, two or three hundred genomes a week, so we can help them to also characterize the, the, the variants that are circulating. More important, we're going to do that in a holistic approach that in addition of generate data from them, that's going to have a strong capacity building program because our vision is that the countries can do this genomic surveillance themselves as the time advance. Yeah, thank you for. Thank you very much, Prof. Um, now we'll go to Dr. Amadou Sar. Can you please tell us about uh, how the Pasteur Institute is supporting countries to detect new variants. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, grand merci, uh, uh, justement, uh, à, à Mary Stephen. Et je voudrais d'abord dire le plaisir que j'ai de partager ce plateau avec la directrice régionale de l'OMS, uh, le Dr. Moeti, et Professeur Tulio Oliveira. Uh, qui sont vraiment les, des personnes extrêmement engagées et mobilisées dans ce, ce, cette lutte contre la COVID et particulièrement dans le sujet qui nous intéresse aujourd'hui. Alors, par rapport au, à l'Institut Pasteur de Dakar, je voudrais d'abord dire que dans le dispositif sénégalais, l'Institut Pasteur de Dakar a en charge la surveillance génomique euh, qui a commencé dès le 5 mars, euh, au début donc, de l'épidémie, et c'est quelque chose qui se poursuit pour euh, non seulement séquencer des souches du Sénégal, mais depuis le début de cette période, on a une capacité et on a aidé plusieurs pays dans ce sens-là, que ce soit le Cameroun dans un premier temps, la Guinée équatoriale, en plus du Sénégal. Au niveau du Sénégal, donc, cette, ce séquençage, cette surveillance génomique a lieu quotidiennement et à ce stade, on a plus de 700 souches qui ont été analysées dans le but justement de voir les évolutions qui pouvaient toucher le diagnostic, les vaccins ou les traitements s'il y avait du nouveau. Ce que je peux dire avec toute cette partie, il y a quand même une attention particulière qui a été portée au cours de ces deux derniers mois, euh, enfin même trois on peut dire, depuis le mois de novembre, à une analyse beaucoup plus systématique de plus de 200 souches avec l'objectif euh, de voir très clairement quel peut, euh, est-ce qu'il y avait ce nouveau variant. Aujourd'hui, je peux dire au Sénégal, après un séquençage de plus de 200 souches qui a été choisi pour couvrir l'ensemble du pays, à différentes périodes, nous n'avons pas identifié des variants 
euh, du nouveau de, du coronavirus 19. Ça, c'est le premier point. Le deuxième élément que je voudrais dire par rapport à la sous-région ouest-africaine, euh, nous avons aujourd'hui vu que le Gamb la Gambie a rapporté déjà trois quarts de variants, euh, tous venant euh, d'Angleterre et euh, au niveau du Nigeria, des variants ont été rapportés, que ce soit d'Afrique du Sud ou d'Angleterre. Maintenant, par rapport aux capacités de l'Institut Pasteur, euh, il y a à ce jour-là, dans le cadre du, du, gel, de, du programme génomique, l'initiative de, de séquençage mis en place par l'OMS et euh, mis en place aussi par l'Africa CDC, il y a une organisation pour euh, aider euh, plusieurs pays qui nous ont été désignés pour la région. Je vais les nommer rapidement, c'est le Mali, le Burkina, la Guinée-Bissau, la Côte d'Ivoire, le euh, le Niger et le Cap Vert, et, et bien évidemment la Guinée. Euh, il y a la Gambie qui a des capacités en interne. Ça, c'est par rapport aux pays qui, que, que, que l'on va couvrir dans le cadre de cette région. Mais il y a des initiatives aussi qui sont faites au niveau des instituts pasteurs, où aujourd'hui, 9 des 10 instituts pasteurs qui existent sur le continent africain vont envoyer euh, des séquences au niveau du Sénégal pour renforcer justement ces capacités euh, et faire du séquençage le temps que ces pays euh, se, se soient prêts. Il s'agit de l'Algérie, de la Tunisie, du Niger, euh, Côte d'Ivoire, de de, du Madagascar, du Cameroun, euh, de la Guinée et des différents pays qui sont hébergés par les instituts pasteurs, ce qui permet aussi d'avoir ce, cette capacité qui est, qui est déjà disponible. Et nous, avons aussi en train, nous sommes en train de travailler avec la Banque islamique de développement pour appuyer ces autres pays. En termes de capacité, aujourd'hui, avec ce qu'on a bâti avec l'OMS Africa CDC, nous sommes en, en capacité pour traiter jusqu'à 500 euh, euh, génomes par semaine. Et cette capacité, on est en train de s'organiser pour l'augmenter, euh, pour mettre à disposition le temps que ces différentes capacités puissent être disponibles dans, dans les différents pays. Alors, l'autre élément qui me paraît important au-delà du séquençage, et le docteur Moïti l'a rappelé, c'est qu'il faut qu'on ait une capacité à échanger des données. De ce point de vue-là, l'Institut Pasteur de Dakar est un hub de la plateforme mondiale Gizate, qui jusqu'à présent a, en fait, a la capacité donc de, de les faire à partir de cette plateforme, de faire l'échange rapidement, aussi longtemps que les pays le souhaitent et sont disponibles. Ça aussi, c'est un deuxième élément parce qu'il s'agit d'apporter une assistance sur le séquençage en tant que tel, mais sur l'analyse et mettre ces informations disponibles pour que les différents pays puissent l'utiliser. Euh, plus concrètement, dans l'immédiat, donc la semaine dernière, nous avons traité pour la Mauritanie un peu plus de, de 20 génomes et actuellement, on s'apprête à en recevoir du Cameroun, de Madagascar, en plus de ce qu'on fait du Sénégal. Et cette capacité, on va la monter dans les prochaines semaines et avec un minimum dans les deux prochains mois de faire 1500 génomes, mais des possibilités d'en faire un peu plus. Voilà ce que je voulais dire euh, concernant les capacités au niveau de l'Institut Pasteur de Dakar et la disponibilité pour aider dans le traitement des séquences ou aussi pour aider dans la, le séquençage de ces génomes. Merci. Thank you, Dr. Sarr. So now that we have heard from all the panelists, It is now uh, time to ask your question. Please use the Q&A function on the Zoom to ask your question. Tell us your name and the name of the news media you represent. Uh, also to remind you that we have a translation in French and English. You can use uh, the globe icon and select your most preferred um, language. Uh, let's go now to David from Financial Times. Hello, yeah. yeah. Hi, yes, I, hope you can, I hope you can hear me. Um, yes. I have a lot of questions, but I'll, I'll limit myself to two um, uh, initially. Um, first of all, I would like to know um, uh, what the vaccine, what an appropriate vaccine strategy in the African continent, insofar as one can talk about the African continent as a whole, what that would look like this year in terms of you know the rollout of the vaccine um uh what percentage of the population could realistically be expected to be vaccinated by the end of this year 
um, and the mixture of vaccines, um, uh, you know, whether the AstraZeneca or the J&J that is not yet um, uh, proven or even the Chinese and Russian vaccines. So I'd be interested in an overview of the um, vaccine strategy. Um, uh, a different question. Um, there was a, uh, a report um, of a, a, a non-peer reviewed paper um, out of Boston University uh, that was um, uh, that looked at um, people who had died in Zambia. So, it, uh, uh, and it tested people for COVID in the morgue in Lusaka and found that there was a much higher prevalence of COVID um, than had been reported. Um, now this is unpeer reviewed and was only taken in one city, but the implication from the researchers of this um, report uh, was that perhaps um, COVID cases were being undercounted in parts of the continent. I'd be very interested in your opinions of whether you think that is a, a plausible hypothesis or not. Thank you. Thank you, David. I will pass uh, your question to Dr. Moetti and then Dr. Richard could compliment. Over to you, Dr. Moetti. Um, yes, uh, thank you very much from the, our colleague from the Financial Times for those two questions. I think I'll ask Richard to start with a question on the vaccine strategy for the, for the continent. And then uh, I will say something about the possible underreporting of cases in Africa. So Richard, do you wanna come in? Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you, Dr. Moetti. Um, uh, good morning to uh, the colleague uh, from The uh, Economist. Um, I think this is a very important question. Um, with regard to the vaccine strategy in the region, um, I think our strategy has been um, consistent with um, uh, what WHO has been advising the country. Um, in um, light of the um, um, very limited uh, um, vaccine doses that are currently available, and this is not specific to Africa, by the way. I think we are seeing it even elsewhere, um, uh, even in the high income countries. Um, the, the strategy has been really first to prioritize the uh, most uh, vulnerable uh, groups, starting with uh, um, the healthcare workers, um, and then moving to other people who are, are living with uh, uh, comorbidities or um, uh, being uh, uh, defined by the countries as um, a special group of uh, interests. So um, in terms of the percentage that could be realistically re reached, uh, before the end of the year, I think there are two uh, uh, major avenues that we are pursuing uh, here in, in, in Africa. The first one indeed is the uh, initiative that uh, is mainly led by WHO, uh, Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance and CEPI through the COVAX. And um, the objective is to reach 20% uh, uh, at least, to cover 20% uh, of the population by the end of the year. And um, I might say that um, uh, with the latest development within the COVAX facility, um, there is a very, very good prospect that this objective to um, um, supply up to 600 million doses by the end of uh, 2021 will definitely be reached. The other interesting avenue that uh, we are looking at, it's uh, the um, uh, African Vaccine uh, Acquisition Task Team, which is an initiative led by the uh, African Union uh, commission uh, that is uh, um, um, planning to uh, complement or augment the capacity of the vaccination that is going to be supplied by uh, um, uh, COVAX. So um, there was an announcement uh, last week of uh, close to 270 million uh, doses uh, that has been uh, uh, secured through that initiative. Um, but we know very well that some of these doses may not become available soon. So um, realistically, we could expect around um, another 10, 15, or 20 percent, uh, 10 to 15 percent that could be covered. So globally, reaching 30, 35 percent could be uh, a realistic uh, assumption by the end of 2021. So in, in line of the different vaccines, um, uh, as we know, all the countries, even beyond, beyond Africa, are looking at the different products because we can't have only one vaccine to cover the needs. Um, the uh, deals that has been secured through uh, COVAX 
are mainly uh, the AstraZeneca um, uh, vaccine. Uh, but also last week, there was an announcement of uh, 40 million of uh, the Pfizer uh, uh, vaccine. Um, with the uh, uh, African uh, Union um, uh, as well, there is an agreement with uh, um, a Pfizer vaccine produced by Serum Institute of India, uh, as well as uh, a few doses with the Pfizer vaccine. But I'd like to conclude by saying that uh, WHO has, uh, uh, is continuing to explore uh, the, the uh, uh, emergency use uh, listing of additional candidate vaccine. Currently, the Sinopharm vaccine under evaluation by WHO, and we are expecting maybe before the end of the year uh, to uh, have some good data with the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, which will use one dose. And that will be very interesting for many reasons in terms of the logistics uh, for the African uh, region. Uh, so I will stop here, Dr. Moeti, and, and thank you. Okay, um, thanks very much, Richard, for that uh, comprehensive answer. I mean, as far as the um, undercounting or underestimation of uh, cases in the in the country, so we have no doubt that um, because of the challenges that countries have faced since the beginning of the pandemic, and the situation has ebbed and flowed with access to testing supplies, especially that. Um, the rates of testing have varied a great deal in uh, the region, but we have had uh, over 20 countries consistently testing at lower rates than WHO would be recommending, which is 10 per uh, thousand population. So what we've seen is that generally the, the smaller and middle income countries have been able to acquire these supplies and are testing at above the minimum recommended rate of WHO. And it's, test, it's, it's tended to be the low income countries uh, that have really struggled. We are very much reliant on international aid, on donations, and uh, have been part of the confrontation really with the distorted global markets in these supplies, especially where, where testing has been suboptimal. So it is quite likely, and we've said so repeatedly throughout uh, last year, that um, there's no doubt that the number of cases that are reported underrepresents the number of people that are, that are infected. And it's a very good thing that now we have uh, rapid tests that can test for antibodies, for example, that then will be able to tell us to the degree to which the virus is likely to have been circulating in any locality and, and enable then the adjustment of the strategies accordingly. Thank you, Dr. Moeti. Uh, Nabila from ETV News. Please ask your question. Hi, this is a question to be directed to Professor Tulio. He made an announcement last week about a new variant that had been found in KwaZulu-Natal called the B1.177. What do we know about this variant so far? Because we haven't heard anything officially about it. And my second question to him is currently, as a country and where we're going, is there a potential of us seeing a third and a fourth wave in South Africa? Okay, thank you. Yeah, so so a number a number of, uh, of things. Yeah, South Africa has, has implemented quite um, a detailed genomic surveillance network. Yeah, and and, and to be honest, we have seen hundreds of, of lineages yeah, in, in the country, which, which mostly got replaced by, by the 501 uh, V2 or the B1351. Yeah. One thing that as we continue our genomic surveillance, we see, we see some lineages that, that, that are continuously being introduced in South Africa. I wouldn't call them a variant because a variant is what you, we, we are reserving at the moment as we call a variant of concern. Yeah, so we have detected a B1177. This is a very common uh, lineage that has circulated in Europe in the in the autumn, yeah, and also in the in in the winter. Yeah, it's not the B1. One seven, but in today we we we, we just reported the, the first important case of the B one one seven that is the the variant of concern that is in, in the UK yeah, 
and 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 it's quite common that that in addition to our main the variant that that that's dominating we're going to still have like introductions of new of new lineages yeah and in the case they they become to spread very fast yeah then we will communicate that's probably uh, and and then highlight that could be a variant of concern but for the moment these two introductions yeah pro most probably from the from the uk that's where these variants they they had high prevalence yeah they seem to be single introductions that 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 have been south africa and at and 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 they don't don't seem of being spreading very fast. Yeah. In relationship of your your next question, if you can expect the third or fourth wave, yeah, my honestly answer is that we don't know. Yeah. And I think that one of the things that this variant highlighted to the whole world, yeah, is that we, we should this should be a really wake up call to control transmission of SARS-CoV-2, not only in their own country, but to try to control the transmission as a global community, yeah? Because we have to really decrease transmission to avoid the next waves. And more worried that the, the emergence of new variants of concern that could, could transmit faster or evade immune, immune uh, pressure. Okay, thank you, Prof. Uh, the next question is going to Dr. Moeti and then uh, Dr. Sal. Dr. Moeti, your question, what do you think of the decision by ECOWAS to standardize the cost of PCR, PCR tests? Is there a WHO initiative to make uh, the test more available and or affordable on the continent? And then the second question goes to Dr. Sal. Is it known how many people are tested per day in Senegal, apart from travelers and people with symptoms? Do you believe that improving testing capacity will help stem the second wave in the country? So Dr. Sal, you can answer in French, but first Dr. Moretti, over to you. Um, okay, thank you. Thanks for that question. Uh, I think it's a very good uh, idea, initiative by the ECOWAS, uh, uh, leadership, political leadership to, to decide to standardize the cost of PCR tests. And I believe the motivation was to make this testing affordable for people so that um, to maximize knowledge of people's status, particularly in relation to cross-border travel, so that there's some sort of standardization if people, somebody's traveling from one country to the other and, and to encourage and enable people to be tested um, and all sorts of people. So people who must travel, are people who have uh, resources and people who might be engaged in business, family travel, who have limited resources. So I, this I think was just to uh, push affordability and enable then the implementation of the, the regional protocol on managing and controlling transmission in, 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 uh, across the borders. Um, is there a WHO um, uh, initiative to make tests more available? I think we've worked very hard as WHO since the very beginning of the pandemic at all levels, starting with a global platform that WHO put in place with partners such as UNICEF and others to pool the procurement of tests so that we could compete on a very difficult uh, global market and procure supplies, particularly for low-income countries and uh, for countries that need support, including in terms of paying for, for these supplies. It has been a very up and down situation, sometimes extremely challenging. And as I said earlier, our countries uh, have, have struggled, some of our countries have struggled throughout to make uh, uh, tests available. And certainly what we do to make tests affordable also is to disseminate information on the pricing of tests so that that enables those who are procuring to be able to negotiate based on what they know the manufacturer or the supplier has provided. We think, uh, and this is something that WHO has been doing for many years in terms of improving access to affordable items, medicines, um, uh, items that are needed for diagnostics, including these tests. Uh, of course, we, we expect 
that the manufacturers will also play fair on the market, make their profits, but also charge the type of prices that really are relevant for the situation of uh, an emergency like a global pandemic. Okay, thank you, Dr. In terms of capacities, uh, um, just wanted to mention between the beginning up to now, Senegal has actually multiplied more than 10. And we start with uh, two labs in Dakar, and now it's uh, in all different countries. We have more than 14 labs for, for a country covering quite well the whole country um, in terms of um, the capacities. Uh, Senegal have no specific capacities uh, based on the strategy that has been defined. Uh, every day we test between 1,600 1, uh, to 2,000 uh, tests, which is really trying to focus on reducing the transmission and focusing on symptomatic case and running uh, the contact around. Um, now, concerning that, uh, the fact that we're testing with travelers and we're testing at the same time with uh, for the surveillance, this is the national strategies, but I, I don't think there is any problem with this capacity and to test more. Recently, the government has also decided to deploy a much larger leveled um, the rapid test, the RDTs, and to make sure that we are capturing all the different uh, people that are tested. This is also done with a digital platform, which is being in, uh, put together in place. So, so far, uh, that's the strategy. We're going to amplify the number of one, but all we want to do is do that in a control manner that people can not only test for testing, but testing, but uh, uh, complementing the strategy into isolating and making sure we treat people that are positive. So this has to be seen as an integrated system. That's why it is done very careful. Over to you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Sal. Uh, the next question is from uh, Lisa from VOA. Lisa, are you there? Yes, I am. Thank you. Please go Thank ahead with your question. Thank you very much. Um, to Dr. Moriti or any of the other panelists who wish to jump in. Um, Dr. Moriti, you, you mentioned uh, COVID fatigue among the uh, African population. I believe the whole world is fatigued. Uh, are you afraid that this could result in a huge spike of infections throughout the con continent? And given the reported uh, increased contagion of the new variants, um, are you fearful of being of having your hospitals being overwhelmed by patients? How will you be able to handle this? And then one other quick question, please. And that is, Dr. Tedros uh, recently mentioned that only Guinea had received 25 vaccines, uh, and that um, I'm wondering whether the the COVAX. Um, uh, facility is operating better and whether Africa has now received vaccines? If so, how many? Are you anticipating more? And how will you ensure the fair distribution of these vaccines among the dozens of African countries? Thank you very much. Okay, um, thank you very much for those questions, Lisa. Um, with regard to the fatigue and its potential to, to drive up um, and, and produce subsequent ways, of course, we are very concerned about this. And we are emphasizing in our work with the governments, the countries, with our partners, such as UNICEF uh, in, in the UN and others who are playing a strong role in communication, um, that it's very important to re-energize and help people to sustain these ways of being, these ways of living on a day-to-day -day basis of which they've become a, a bit fatigued. I, I mean, if, I, if you look in all the places that I've been recently uh, here where I'm living, I was in Southern Africa recently, there is no doubt that you are seeing more and more people walking around, the mask is not quite properly covering the nose and mouth. Increasingly, I'm seeing people without a mask at all, and this is becoming uh, natural. 
and the physical distancing is, is becoming a bit tiresome. These uh, interventions must absolutely be, be re-stimulated in people. I, I believe that, um, and we are working with our team here in Afro and our partners to, in a sense, restart and reboot the communication, add to what has been happening already and link up with um, uh, communication groups, networks of people, trusted sources of information, and uh, send the message again that people understand not only is it protecting you, it is very much protecting your families if you do this consistently when you are out and then you come back home. And it's what's going to help us all normalize life and go back to jobs, economies, schools reopening. It's very important to uh, reinforce uh, strengthen, sustain the communication. It's very important as well to know what people are thinking and feeling. What is it that that uh, is adding to the fatigue and what can help people find this more relevant to do in their own lives? So, so it's very much a concern and it's something that we are working with governments to continue to reinforce. In addition, of course, to strengthening those public health interventions like um, testing, contact tracing and isolation, which are all part of the package to contain the risk of uh, further waves of, of, the, of the infection. I'll ask Richard again to, to talk about the, the vaccines, uh, the COVAX, uh, just by saying, just to say that, um, you know, at a moment when the whole world is anxious to get going with this vaccine, we start seeing some countries with more resources to have acquired supplies earlier start vaccinating. I think we can note with uh, concern and disappointment that it wasn't possible to start everywhere in the world at the same time, but we very much need to take the time then to ramp up the preparedness, the readiness, so that when the vaccines arrive on the continent, the type of uh, campaigns that are carried out to deliver them are absolutely effective, are very efficient, and that we make sure that we cover all the people that need to be covered as soon as possible with these very effective, well-prepared uh, delivery campaigns. So Richard, if you could perhaps provide more information about when uh, vaccines are expected to be arriving on the continent. Yes, thank you, uh, Dr. Moeti. Um, so with regards to uh, the uh, uh, start of the vaccination in a few countries, um, the journalists referred to um, um, the few doses that has been administered in Guinea. But um, just to uh, inform our audience that a uh, few countries have started uh, vaccination. Um, Seychelles uh, started since now, uh, uh, three weeks now, um, to immunize the population. Um, and um, they've immunized so far close to uh, uh, 20, 25,000 people. And the vaccination, the campaign is still going on in, in, in Seychelles. Um, they are using the Sinopharm uh, uh, vaccine. Uh, Mauritius uh, started vaccination since two days ago um, using the AstraZeneca vaccine. Um, and the data that we have received this morning, she's showing that um, uh, close to 450 people have already been in uh, uh, immunized. Um, Morocco received uh, 1.5 million doses last week um, and is going to start vaccination tomorrow, by the way, not today. Um, as well as other many countries have started to, um, South Africa has ordered close to 1.5 million and is expecting to start vaccination quite soon. But overall, um, as explained by Dr. Moeti, I think uh, we all uh, uh, agree that um, the, the current situation of supply chain have not uh, facilitated things uh, uh, on the region. But um, with the latest uh, announcement that was made through the COVAX facility, we are really hoping that the first dose is going to be started to rolled out in uh, uh, Africa, probably by uh, mid next month. And um, uh, by March, we will definitely see uh, most of the countries starting uh, vaccinating um, uh, with uh, 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 targeting the high risk group. And I think in terms of the fair distribution of the vaccine, this has been one of the guiding principles of the COVAX facility uh, right at the beginning to make sure that all countries uh, can access some part of the uh, people can get vaccination in all country at the same time. Really that is the core part of the uh, um, initiative that is launched through um, uh, COVAX. 
And we believe that with this prioritization of people who are most at risk, who are um, um, uh, uh, healthcare frontline workers, I think it will achieve a minimum of uh, equity uh, to make sure that those who are needed vaccine can get it first. And while the dose become available, the, the supply could be ramp up and the vaccination continue. So um, it is a slow start, but we are expecting that in the coming month, things are going to, to ramp up. And uh, as said, Dr. Moeti, we are using this window of opportunity to strengthen country readiness and preparedness to make sure that whenever the vaccine arrive, all the country will be 100% ready to start rolling out these products. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Richard. Uh, just to remind journalists that uh, please, uh, you should limit your um, question to just only one question. Uh, the next question is uh, to you, Prof. Uh, this question is coming from Tam Khan from Business Day. How do you think the race between vaccine developers and the mutating coronavirus is going to play out? Are we heading for a situation where we need an annual coronavirus shot? Over to you, Prof. Uh, Tulio. Yes, yeah, thank you. Yeah, so, so that's a very important question, yeah. And, and that's where uh, we find that, that setting up genomic surveillance to quickly identify variants, but also yeah, programs, uh, basic science programs to also see how these variants yeah, behave in, in the lab to, to the new vaccines followed by, by good trials in, in Africa is very important. Yeah, of course that our, our dream for the for, for the COVID ID vaccine would be something like the measles or the polio vaccine that you take once and you're protected for life. Yeah. At the moment, we, we, we have very strong reasons to believe that the current vaccines is still going to be eff efficacious against the, the variants that exist. Yeah. And, and for example, one of the vaccine manufacturers is also already start developing what they call a booster for some of the new variants in case that is needed. Yeah. So I think that 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 time will tell if we're gonna have a fixed vaccine or a vaccine that needs to be updated and more than ever to both decrease transmission, but understand very well what is circulating its crucial importance. Thank you, Prof. George from Rutas, if you're uh, online, please ask your question. Okay, yes, I am. Uh, Go ahead. It's to, it's to, to the WHO Regional Director. Uh, you know, what, what, just following up with what you said about Tanzania, uh, what is WHO doing beyond just calling and urging Tanzania to prepare for vaccination and do more to spread this? To, to prevent the spread of COVID-19 and share its data. Uh, also, what concerns do you have that the stance that WHO has taken today against Tanzania will not lead to your representative there being victimized as it happened in Burundi last year? Um, okay. Uh, I mean, first of all, what, what is WHO doing? You, you know, we have been communicating with the um, Tanzanian government throughout this uh, pandemic at, at the three levels, certainly at the level of our country representative and her team consistently with, uh, with, the, the, with the Minister of Health and also with uh, the Minister of Foreign Affairs at a certain point in time. I have communicated myself with the Minister of Health. The Director General of WHO has communicated with the Minister of Health of uh, Foreign Affairs and we have made uh, uh, attempts to also communicate at the highest uh, level of the leadership of the country. We've also provided the country with support in terms of the preparedness for dealing with the pandemic as we have with every, every country in the world and the region throughout the, the pandemic. We have um, uh, restarted this communication now, as I've said. So we have been in, and our, our country office has also provided support for the country to, to do what was needed in terms of preparing to respond for the pandemic. We are now, as uh, indicated, particularly wishing to have the country take the opportunity, like all other countries, of the tool that is the, the vaccine that's available. 
and therefore we are re-initiating uh, our communication at the highest level of leadership and offering our support as we have done throughout the situation and, and looking for collaboration with Tanzania for the sake of the people of the country, for the sake of the people of the neighboring countries and as well uh, for the sake of the world. What part of our communication has been to remind the government that it is a signatory of the international health regulations in which states parties or member states have accepted to work collectively to prevent the international spread of disease. One of the, the actions there is to share information about any cases that are occurring of any epidemic prone disease. And uh, we have uh, reminded, I have in writing, reminded the government of uh, their being part of this global club and therefore of their obligation to respond in this way. It is our hope that um, our communications, especially the reinstated communications about the vaccine possibility to then, uh, you know, more definitively ensure that the virus is not circulating in the countries will find a positive response. We are expecting the country to be like a member state of the United Nations in terms of their collaboration with our local team in, in addition to our collaboration with us at the regional and the global level. And we hope to have a dialogue which will have positive results for the actions to prevent the further spread of the COVID-19 vaccine in the country, in the region, and also in the world through the participation of all member states in, in this collective action. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Moeti. Uh, the next question is from Lova from uh, Madagascar Radio. Lova, are you online? Okay, if she's not there, I will just read out her questions. And this question will be answered by uh, Dr. Sa. I feel free to answer in French, please. Do all African countries have the means to know which variant is circulating in their territory? Dr. Sa, please. Oui, actuellement, donc, euh, par rapport euh, aux capacités des pays africains de savoir les variantes qui circulent chez eux, je pense que plusieurs pays ont des capacités pour faire du séquençage, qui est la méthode dont on a besoin pour le savoir. Euh, et donc, de ce point de vue-là, si la capacité technique existe, il faudrait juste un système de surveillance qui soit suffisamment euh, élaboré pour capturer les différentes souches qui circulent de manière à ce que les séquences puissent être faites régulièrement. Au-delà des pays qui en ont les capacités propres, l'OMS, Africa CDC et tout le dispositif au niveau régional, l'OAS, sont mis ensemble pour s'assurer que les pays qui n'ont pas ces capacités-là peuvent être soutenus par des centres régionaux comme l'Institut Pasteur de Dakar et les autres qui ont été désignés dans le cadre du réseau qui a été mis en place pour cela. Donc aujourd'hui, potentiellement tous les pays ont la capacité de le faire ou en local ou à travers des réseaux mis en place pour avoir cette information. Mais cela dépend aussi de la capacité du pays à faire de la surveillance pour couvrir les points d'entrée, pour couvrir aussi à l'intérieur du pays, de manière à avoir un maximum de souches à séquencer pour voir justement cette information. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sal. Uh, the next uh, question is uh, from Jean at L uh, RFI. Uh, last week, the president of South Africa complained that African countries have to pay 2.5 times more than the developed countries for vaccines. How can this be explained? Dr. Richard, please. Well, um, so it, it's, uh, it's something uh, that uh, we all uh, have difficult to understand, uh, uh, indeed. Um, um, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a shocking uh, uh, fact that uh, a rich country can pay less than uh, uh, those countries that are, are struggling. Um, however, when we looked at the market dynamics, particularly uh, in this situation where the products are very scarce on the markets, and the rich country claiming that they pre-finance the development of this product, therefore getting a, a preferential price. Um, it's a, um, a difficult as, as well to translate that is a no day-to-day -day understanding on the market dynamic. However, and I think that has been uh, highlighted and uh, 
be the position of WHO for, and our leaders, uh, Dr. Moiti, Dr. Tedros, have called really uh, since the beginning of this on this uh, issue of global solidarity and uh, equitable distribution of the, the vaccine. Uh, this should not uh, um, stay at the level of uh, distribution, but also, but should be also for those countries that are self-financing, they should access uh, the vaccine at a fair price without, of course, jeopardizing their own uh, economies. Uh, I think we need to stress that we do have, we still do have country in Africa that are not eligible uh, to this uh, um, uh, donation scheme that have to purchase the vaccine themselves. Uh, this is the case of South Africa, but we have also other middle income country in, in Africa, uh, uh, Namibia, Botswana, Mauritius, Seychelles, Gabon, uh, Equatorial Guinea, that are in a situation where they have to pay themselves. So I think it's uh, time really to call for a fair price uh, uh, for those countries so that they can access vaccine at the minimum uh, to the same level of the price that uh, rich countries are, are getting. Thank you, Dr. Richard. Then we have uh, a question from Mathilde. She's from Limond in Jobo. Um, the question is going to Prof. Tulio. What are the sequencing capabilities on the continent? Apart from the Institute Pasteur in Dhaka and CRIFS in South Africa, what are the main research centers taking part in genomic surveillance? Is the current cooperation something new in the scientific world throughout Africa? Prof, please. Okay, yeah, yeah thank you for the question. So, so at the moment we have we have many uh, sequencing centers in the African continent. Of course, not as many as we would like, but very important. We have we we, we have started um, um, uh, almost a year ago a comprehensive program, which is called the Pathogen Genomic Initiative. That that that's a collaboration between the is coordinated by the Africa CDC to together with the World Health Organization. Yeah. In this program, it is it, it, it's involved in 52 countries. Yeah. And you have three different levels of, of, of laboratories. Yeah. You have what we call a specialized lab that, that, that's, that has um, a lot of sequencing capacity. And at the moment, we have two, one in South Africa that, that, that I, I, I direct, that's called CRISP and another one in, in Nigeria, that's Professor Christian Happier. And that's a laboratory that have more capacity and they are sparing capacity to support it. the other labs, yeah. And then you have regional labs, yeah, that, that you have many more region that also the genomic capacity for the region and the country and then national labs, yeah. So at the moment, um, it is uh, many more labs are being equipped and getting read for the genomic surveillance. Our expectation with the Africa CDC and the WHO is this year to ramp genomic surveillance to, to at least 30,000 genomes in the Africa continent. Yeah. But what we are looking is not just for numbers. What we are looking is a very um, pragmatic and systematic approach that we sequence like, for example, like 100 or 200 genomes for a given country every month. And that is continuously together with the national uh, laboratories, which would be responsible for selecting appropriate representative sampling. OK, thank you very much, uh, Prof. We have uh, another question from uh, Mark Santora from the New York, New York Times. Can you please? expand on what we know about the effectiveness of the AstraZeneca vaccines, specifically as it relates to the variant identified in South Africa. Also, is there any data on Russian or Chinese vaccine and the variants? Prof, you can start and Dr. Richard can complement. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah. at the moment, yeah, I, I personally don't have any data on the AstraZeneca vaccine and effective on the um, of the variants but we know about many colleagues in south africa that has run the vaccine trials yeah that are currently uh, analyzing this data as the vaccine trials it, it finish and so i believe that will that should be public data in the next few days or in the next a week yeah but i i, I don't have that kind of information at the moment 
Okay, Dr. Richard, please. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, Mary, I didn't very well, uh, the line was not good. Can you please? Repeat? Okay, the, the question is from Mark uh, from New York Times. He's asking, can you please expand on what we know about the effectiveness of the AstraZeneca vaccine, specifically as, as it relates to the variant identified oh, in South okay. Yes. Yeah, well. And also if there is any data on the Russian or Chinese vaccines and the variants. Well, um, the, as my predecessor said, we, there is very limited information yet uh, on the, uh, the, these other candidates, uh, these other vaccine on the, the efficacy of the new variant. I think uh, probably this is still too early to, to, to say. Um, so for the moment, we just don't have enough data on that, um, apart from what was published by Moderna uh, uh, and um, uh, Pfizer, which are both, uh, uh, vaccine that are using the uh, messenger RNA uh, platform. Uh, so we will have to wait a bit to see what, what will happen with the, the other vaccine using a different platform. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Richard. Uh, the next question is to you, Dr. Sal. Um, there, there is a recent announcement from Professor Mbu that uh, the British variant is now uh, in Senegal. So what can you tell us about this uh, new variant and uh, how it, uh, it explains the speed of uh, infection in Senegal? Um, vous avez raison, je viens d'entendre l'information. Au moment où euh, nous faisions cette conférence de presse, euh, j'ai entendu, on m'a passé l'information qu'un autre centre qui travaille au Sénégal, dirigé par le professeur Moup, avait identifié dans des, des prélèvements le variant euh, anglais, euh, mais je n'ai pas plus d'informations que cela. Au moment où on démarrait cette conférence avec les informations, on n'avait pas de, aucune nouvelle de, justement de la présence du variant anglais sur le Sénégal. Maintenant, euh, riche de cette expérience, je vois deux ou trois points qui me paraissent importants de continuer. C'est de continuer la surveillance euh, génomique au Sénégal pour savoir euh, ce variant-là. Euh, son ampleur dans la circulation, est-ce que c'est le cas comme on a pu le voir en Afrique du Sud qui a remplacé les différents autres variants, mais aussi de continuer euh, à travers cette surveillance euh, de voir par une analyse épidémiologique détaillée si ça, la circulation de ce variant a un impact euh, sur euh, la virulence ou sur euh, la capacité d'être neutralisée. À ce stade, c'est tout ce que je peux dire. Je vous remercie. Thank you, Dr. Sal. The next question is to you, uh, Dr. Moretti. This question is from Eniola from Punch, Nigeria. The Nigerian government says um, they are prioritizing health workers, the vulnerable, and government officials for vaccines. Wouldn't priority be uh, given to government officials undermine equitable distribution of vaccines? Um, thank you very much. I, I think WHO has provided guidance on um, prioritizing and how to sequentially um, distribute the vaccine and vaccinate different population subgroups with, with a combination of one, their role, their, their very important role as far as health workers are concerned in, in, in the response to the pandemic and the potential spread in the healthcare settings of this virus. And then secondly, of course, to do something about mortality. I um, imagine, I have not seen in detail whether government officials means every single government official in Nigeria. I imagine what there would be a breakdown of people playing critical roles in certain areas of uh, uh, the economy, development, health, perhaps uh, such areas as education. I think one would need to understand better what this means. Uh, what we would like to emphasize is the principle of first, the idea is to as quickly as possible, get a maximum number of people who play certain roles uh, in, in, uh, in, in countries, in the health system, in other parts, critical parts of the economy protected. One, 
to break the chain of transmission and two, to have an impact on the level of mortality by protecting those who are most vulnerable to getting serious parts of the infection and then progressively rolling out to, to the rest of the population. This is what I can say. Thank you, Dr. Moyeti. Um, the next question is to you, Dr. Richard. Which vaccine candidates are likely to be the most useful from African countries? Uh, this question is coming from a new scientist. Well, um, I, th I think we have heard this question several times. I think for the moment, I believe that the, uh, the priority really is to use the available vaccines that could be uh, uh, out there to uh, make sure that people are protected. But having said that, we know that some of these uh, vaccines come with uh, different features that are making them quite very difficult to uh, be rolled out uh, in uh, uh, certain places uh, because of the characteristics of the uh, product uh, themselves. Um, so in that regard, um, as you know, WHO, we don't recommend specific product, we recommend uh, um, vaccines uh, that could be easily be used and roll out uh, in the, in, in the uh, different uh, community. So it's true that uh, vaccines that are going to use the regular cold chain system uh, will be of great uh, 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 favor for many countries. Uh, also vaccine that will use, for, for, for example, one dose versus two doses are really uh, going to be quite very attractive uh, for many countries. So we do have few uh, products for the moment that fit that characteristics. I think the AstraZeneca one is cheap, is uh, um, um, being stored in a regular temperature. The upcoming Johnson & Johnson vaccine will also be very attractive uh, to the fact that it only be using one dose and be stored in the regular uh, uh, cold, chain, cold chain system. But the priority now is really to immunize people uh, as soon as possible with the available vaccine. But as we rolled out the product, all of these parameters are going to play uh, to make sure that the vaccination become uh, sustainable. Thank you, Dr. Richard. Um, we are coming to the end of this uh, press briefing for today. So let's turn back to our panelists for their final words. So we will start with uh, Dr. Sal, Prof. Tulio, then uh, Dr. Moetti. Um, oui, pour ma part, je voudrais d'abord remercier pour cette conférence et toutes les questions très intéressantes et dire que dans le domaine qui aujourd'hui nous a un peu occupé, à savoir les vaccins et les variants, je voudrais dire que par rapport aux capacités actuelles de séquençage, il y a vraiment une dynamique qui s'est installée qui permet déjà d'avoir un appui entre différents pays pour justement connaître et mesurer exactement la circulation et qui progressivement, comme on l'a fait pour le diagnostic et pour les autres euh, contre-mesures médicales, va euh, s'installer sur toute l'Afrique selon les dispositions qui ont été mises en place. Le deuxième élément, c'est que ce variant-là, les variants ont, font l'objet d'une étude extrêmement active sur laquelle l'Afrique, nos pays sont dans une dynamique extrêmement claire pour pouvoir avoir un maximum d'informations et adapter notre stratégie par rapport à l'évolution de, de la circulation et de la connaissance qu'on a de ces variants. Et dernier point, euh, dans ce contexte-là, qui me paraît important, toute notre réflexion sur le vaccin, comme l'a dit euh, le docteur Moetti, euh, se fait dans un cadre de préparation. Et même si les vaccins arrivent un peu plus tardivement que dans les autres continents, il faut mettre à profit cette période-là pour justement étudier toutes ces questions et se préparer au mieux à leur développement. Voilà, et c'est les points sur lesquels je voulais insister et vous remercie en disant à l'Institut Passeur de Dakar à, bien évidemment, pour cette période-là, une mobilisation pour appuyer au Sénégal, dans la sous-région ouest-africaine et au-delà. Merci. Thank you, Dr. Sal. Prof? Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. just to thank the WHO for this opportunity. And my last remarks is just to say that the appearance of these variants, both in the African continent, but in, in South America and the Europe continent, yeah, it really means that more than ever is the time that we don't leave any continent behind especially on the vaccination, but also on the, on the main public health response. 
So more than ever, it is a global responsibility to increase and support both, uh, especially Africa, to also scale uh, vaccine in the same way as the developed country. We really have to protect our healthcare workers. We don't have that many and they are very precious, but also our elderly. So just to plead for the rest of the world before they, they just move to vaccinate all the young population that they think that's a very important population here that also need protection from these strong vaccines. Thank you. Thank you, Pop. Uh, Dr. Richard, before we go back to Dr. Moeti. Well, um, I, I think that uh, um, the, there was a lot of question in the chat box uh, around the uh, accept acceptability and uh, the rollout of the vaccine uh, in the continent. So I would like just to uh, reassure our audience that uh, WHO um, is doing really all it can to uh, increase the preparedness uh, uh, of the different countries to make sure that they are ready uh, to introduce the vaccine when they become available. We are working quite very hard to make sure that the country can access uh, uh, the uh, vaccine dose as soon uh, as possible. Our risk communication and community engagement uh, team working with all the partners, uh, really trying to um, uh, make all the efforts to combat all the misinformation around vaccination and but to engage more actively the community for the acceptance of the vaccine. So we, we will continue to uh, provide this uh, support to the countries um, and make sure that uh, uh, the vaccine become available as soon as possible and support them for the uh, effective rollout of this product. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Richard. And finally to you, Dr. Moeti. So thanks, Mary. I mean, uh, to finish, first, I'd really like to thank my co-panelists, um, Prof. Tulio and uh, Dr. Sal. Uh, one, for the work that you are doing as scientists in the institutions that you are leading, but also very much for this um, strong engagement in continental solidarity in providing your facilities um, your expertise to the other countries on the continent. I think it's an excellent example of what is needed, not only within the continent, but at the global level, as you both referred to in relation to uh, access to vaccines. And as I said earlier, in, in referred to access to other um, items that are so vital in this, in this global uh, response. And then secondly, just to say, yes, we learn about new variants of the vaccine. Unfortunately, some of them look to be more, if you like, dangerous in terms of uh, transmissibility. But at the end of the day, we need to go back to the fundamental actions that need to be taken by individuals in our families, in our homes, and by the public health systems of countries that are effective against these, um, these variants, even if uh, they need much more emphasis than if, if, the, if the virus is much more transmissible. So again, as individuals, let us renew our commitment to what we have to do at home, at work, if we're actually going to work, to protect ourselves, to protect others, wearing our masks, uh, keeping a distance, and um, hand washing and hygiene and spreading the right information, both about the, the variants, the risk, and also about the vaccine. The vaccine is a tool that's going to make a huge difference all over the world. And so we are encouraging people to make yourself ready to receive it when it's your turn to receive it and encourage others to do so. And then again, I'd like to add my own voice in terms of the global solidarity that's needed. And just remind that uh, having a corner of the world not protected, the way the world's economies and peoples are connected will have negative economic impact even in those countries that managed to vaccinate the entire populations because as the professor said we still have to learn about uh, the, the how long the immunity uh, conferred by these vaccines lasts and therefore if the susceptibility will return the, these are all still open so just to emphasize we really are all in it together and we have to work to support each other to overcome this global crisis. Thank you very much for having joined us to, to all our journalist colleagues. Thank you, uh, Dr. Moeti, and I would like all participants to help me and join me to thank all our uh, 
Uh, panelist, Dr. Mashidisho Moyeti, the Regional Director for Africa here in Brazzaville, uh, Dr. Richard Mihigo from uh, the Regional Office in Brazzaville, Professor Tulio from South Africa, and Dr. Amadou Sal from Institute Pasteur, all the way from Dakar. Thank you very much. As we go, uh, Dr. Richard is happy to stay and, and address some of uh, the French media question for some time, so you can hold on. Thank you. The press conference is over. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Merci. Juste pour vous dire que pour les journalistes francophones, euh, vous pouvez, euh, il y a le docteur Richard Mikiko qui est là et qui peut répondre à quelques questions en français. Merci. Oui, bonjour. Um, donc ici, c'est Kadija Diallo. Je suis euh, à la communication au bureau régional. Je vais essayer de faciliter avec le docteur Richard Mihigo pour certaines questions qui ont été reçues en français. Euh, je ne sais pas, est-ce que docteur Richard, vous êtes connecté, docteur Mihigo? Oui, absolument, je, je suis toujours en ligne. D'accord, merci. Donc, il y a, on a reçu plusieurs questions qui se ressemblent. Hein, donc, je vais essayer un peu de, de, de faire un, récap, un récapitulatif. Mais euh, la première question euh, que je voulais euh, relayer ici, elle a été posée par Marie Mamane de la RTS, Radio-Télévision Sénégalaise. Donc, elle demande, est-ce que les personnes souffrant de maladies chroniques doivent se faire vacciner et doit-on vacciner une personne qui a déjà développé la maladie? Et enfin, est-ce qu'après cela, la personne vaccinée sera immunisée pour de bon? À vous, docteur Mihigo. OK, merci uh, uh, pour uh, cette uh, question. Il uh, faut, faut d'abord préciser que la, la vaccination a, a pour objectif uh, uh, ultime à déprotéger toute personne contre l'acquisition d'une maladie infectieuse. Et éventuellement, une fois cette personne vaccinée, ne pas, dans le cas échéant, faire de, des formes graves de cette pathologie. Alors, en ce qui concerne les personnes avec des maladies chroniques, nous avons malheureusement constaté que ces personnes sont des personnes hautement à risque lorsqu'elles contractent à le, virus contre, le virus de la COVID, ces personnes sont extrêmement exposées à des risques de forme grave et, et, et éventuellement une mortalité élevée dans cette couche de la population. Donc, il est extrêmement important que ces personnes-là soient vaccinées pour éventuellement éviter de tomber dans, 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 dans cette situation. Alors, pour les personnes qui ont déjà fait la maladie, est-ce que c'est important de se faire vacciner? Absolument, parce que jusque-là, nous ne connaissons pas encore. Et ça a été dit lors de la conférence qui vient juste de se terminer. Jusqu'à quand et comment est-ce que la protection va, va, va durer? Et nous pensons que les, les recommandations actuelles restent de faire vacciner tout le monde, y compris ceux qui ont éventuellement la maladie et qui en, ont, qui en sont sortis euh, indemnes parce que euh, la vaccination va certainement, va certainement jouer un rôle de booster de leur système immunitaire euh, pour aller de l'avant. D'accord. Euh, merci, docteur Migo. Euh, nous avons reçu une autre question de Pamela Kumba de Channel Africa. Elle voudrait savoir euh, est-ce qu'il y a déjà un vaccin pour le nouveau variant en Afrique du Sud et à ce jour, combien de pays africains ont commencé la vaccination? Et enfin, avons-nous déjà quelques résultats? Bon, comme ça a été dit euh, lors de la conférence qui vient de se terminer, euh, les premières données que nous avons pour le moment, euh, en tout cas pour ce qui concerne les données de euh, certains vaccins comme celui de Pfizer ou de Moderna, euh, viennent de montrer que leur vaccin reste quand même efficace contre les nouvelles variantes qui ont été détectées, principalement la variante du virus britannique, mais également la variante sud-africaine. Alors, il est important de continuer à faire la surveillance, la circulation de ces différentes variantes, de voir dans quelle mesure les différentes mutations pourraient influencer sur la validité ou l'efficacité des vaccins donc pour les autres candidats vaccins, nous attendons encore des informations 
sur la, 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 la protection éventuelle de ces vaccins contre les, les, les variantes qui viennent d'être détectées. Donc, c'est quelque chose qui doit continuer à être surveillé de près. Mais il faudra souligner une chose, que la meilleure stratégie d'éviter que ces variantes ne deviennent dominantes, c'est que les gens puissent d'abord se faire protéger avant. Et lorsque nous protégeons les gens avant, soit par les mesures barrières dont nous avons pas, le docteur Moïti a insisté, mais également la combinaison de ces mesures barrières avec une vaccination, cela nous permettra de limiter la circulation du, 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 du virus et éventuellement éviter la survenue des nouvelles variantes qui peuvent échapper à la... Alors, pour ce qui concerne les noms, je l'ai souligné avant, nous avons les Seychelles qui ont, depuis bientôt, qui ont commencé la vaccination depuis le 10 janvier avec le vaccin de Sinopharm. À la date d'aujourd'hui, presque 25 000 personnes ont été vaccinées dans ce pays-là. Il y a deux jours, les îles Maurice, l'île Maurice a également commencé la vaccination en utilisant le vaccin de AstraZeneca. Et euh, euh, aux environs de 450 personnes euh, ont déjà été vaccinées depuis les deux derniers jours. Et l'objectif euh, de la vaccination dans cette île est de vacciner jusqu'à 60 de la population. D'autres pays au niveau de l'Afrique euh, ont commencé également à planifier la vaccination. J'ai parlé du Maroc, euh, qui a reçu également... 1,5 million de doses de AstraZeneca la semaine passée et qui commence la vaccination, je pense, aujourd'hui ou demain. L'Afrique du Sud a également annoncé l'arrivée de presque 1,5 million de doses de vaccins de AstraZeneca et l'Afrique du Sud va également bientôt commencer la vaccination. Et nous travaillons étroitement, l'OMS, avec le gouvernement sud-africain pour appuyer les préparatifs pour l'introduction de ce vaccin. Et nous espérons que la plupart des pays africains vont commencer à recevoir les vaccins à travers l'initiative COVAX dans les semaines à venir et en espérant que vers le mois de fin mars ou plus tard, les toutes premières doses devront commencer à être distribuées à l'ensemble des pays dans la, la, la région de manière proportionnelle. D'accord. Il y a une question qui est, qui est, qui est revenue plusieurs fois. Euh, il a posé tout d'abord par Eugénie de Radio Pyramide au Togo et également par euh, Katobiom Siri de RDC. Donc, c'est par rapport au fait qu'il euh, y aurait des informations sur les réseaux sociaux selon lesquelles le Coca-Cola euh, rendrait le test rapide du COVID positif. Donc, euh, il voudrait qu'on commande par rapport, euh, par rapport à cela, sur le Coca-Cola qui rendrait le test positif du COVID. Bon, écoutez, nous avons vu bon, ces derniers temps pas mal d'informations qui circulent sur les réseaux sociaux. Et effectivement, on a pu voir euh, cette vidéo qui est devenue virale sur euh, les réseaux sociaux. Euh, euh, il n'y a aucune raison, il y a aucune raison de, 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 de penser que le Coca-Cola le rendrait parce qu'il n'y a pas de virus dedans. Euh, donc, il faudra que nous puissions effectivement nous méfier beaucoup de ce genre de d'informations. Nous avons au niveau de l'OMS constitué un groupe qui s'occupe de euh, infodémique, je ne sais pas comment traduire ça en français, pour essayer effectivement de rechercher la plupart de ces informations qui circulent sur le web, de travailler à ce que nous puissions donner la bonne information, la bonne information en ce qui concerne euh, effectivement les faits qui sont avérés euh, par la science euh, et, et dissocier cela des, des, des nouvelles qui circulent sur les réseaux sociaux sans aucun fondement en ce qui concerne des évidences scientifiques. Donc, c'est tout ce que je peux dire sur ce sujet. D'accord, merci docteur. Et également une question qui, qui revient de Chris Octave et également de Christiane Ekambo. Christiane Ekambo, voudrait, elle est de RDC, elle voudrait savoir quelles sont les mesures que, qui qui vont être prises pour convaincre les Africains et puis venir à bout des résistances, surtout quand on se rappelle la vidéo qui avait été publiée par les chercheurs de l'Inserm sur la chaîne française LCI par rapport à la vaccination en Afrique. 
Euh, et un, une question similaire un peu euh, de Eugénie du Togo qui dit que, étant donné que la COVID-19 fait moins de victimes en Afrique, est-ce qu'on a réellement besoin de ce vaccin Et beaucoup craignent que le vaccin ne tue plus que le COVID-19. Et donc, comment euh, on va venir à bout de ces résistances et pourquoi réellement l'Afrique, étant donné qu'il y a moins de décès en Afrique, euh, pourquoi a-t-on réellement besoin de ce vaccin OK. Donc, en ce qui concerne la, la première question et euh, notamment la perception euh, de l'acceptance du vaccin ou pas, et, euh, et la vidéo, effectivement, euh, de chercheur de l'INSERN, qui date des quelques mois, je crois que l'année passée, au mois d'avril-mai. Je pense que je voudrais d'abord insister sur le fait qu'en son temps, l'OMS avait fortement, fortement condamné ces propos, que nous avons jugés extrêmement préjudiciables sur la, la vaccination, mais également qui avait une connotation carrément raciste. Et nous avons, à tous les niveaux, extrêmement condamné euh, cette euh, sortie. Et d'ailleurs, euh, les mêmes scientifiques euh, euh, s'étaient excusés euh, par rapport à, à cela. Alors, en ce qui concerne l'acceptation de, de la vaccination, il faudra peut-être des fois dissocier ce que nous regardons euh, dans, euh, sur les réseaux sociaux et, 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 et la réalité. En partenariat avec euh, nos collègues de Africa CDC, nous avons conduit une euh, étude euh, assez représentative dans 15 pays de la région africaine pour essayer d'analyser euh, la perception et surtout la possibilité euh, des différentes populations au niveau de la région africaine pour accepter le, 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 le vaccin. Et, et je, je peux vous rassurer que euh, les résultats de, de, de cette étude sont extrêmement euh, euh, positifs. Dans certains pays, nous avons jusqu'à 95 des gens qui ont dit qu'ils euh, étaient prêts, ils étaient prêts à, à, à se faire euh, vacciner. Et euh, dans d'autres, c'est vrai que nous avions quand même une proportion euh, assez importante entre 15 à 20 euh, voire 25 des gens qui doutaient un peu de bienfaits de la vaccination. Mais je crois que ce qui est important ici de souligner, c'est que euh, de manière générale, de manière générale, les populations africaines n'ont aucun problème avec la vaccination. Dans la vaccination de routine de tous les jours, nous assistons à une situation où les parents amènent leurs enfants à la vaccination sans aucun problème. Donc, nous n'avons pas spécifiquement de problème de vaccination en Afrique. Alors, la situation actuelle, c'est vrai, avec la COVID-19, et pour répondre à la question du de, de deuxième journaliste, pour dire, est-ce que euh, la COVID n'est-tu pas moins en Afrique? Est-ce que c'est est important? Je pense que la réalité est que nous avons presque 3,6 millions de cas qui ont été répertoriés en Afrique et presque 90, nous, nous, nous atteignons presque les 90 000 décès. Et comme nous savons, nous, des fois, les systèmes de rapportage dans certains pays posent des problèmes sur la, la, la vraie ampleur de la, de, de, de la maladie, je crois qu'il est extrêmement important que les journalistes vous nous aidiez à sensibiliser l'opinion sur la dangerosité de cette maladie, sur l'importance de se faire vacciner, parce que ce n'est que ça qui pourra mettre réellement un frein à cette pandémie. Merci, docteur. Juste pour clôturer, parce qu'on est pris par le temps, je voudrais juste rappeler à tous les confrères journalistes que les questions ont été combinées, donc beaucoup ont reçu déjà réponse. Donc, pour conclure, juste deux dernières questions. Euh, une, des, une de ces questions, elle vient de Anderson Akoué du Togo, qui, voudrait, euh, qui commente en disant, en refusant de faire partie de l'alliance COVAX tout en privilégiant le COVID organique, est-ce que la position de Madagascar ne risque pas d'influencer d'autres pays du continent qui ont des, des remèdes locaux Et est-ce qu'il y aurait des sanctions pour les pays réfractaires à la vaccination Et la toute dernière question euh, venant de Mustapha Azouga du Maroc, est-ce qu'il y a des initiatives pour délocaliser la production des vaccins développés par les laboratoires dans le continent? Merci. À vous, docteur Nico. OK. Euh, vraiment des questions assez intéressantes. Pour la première, en ce qui concerne Madagascar et euh, euh, éventuellement la COVID organique, euh, comme vous le savez, euh, Madagascar euh, a été euh, fortement affecté par la pandémie. 
Et, et euh, nous avons tous vu les limitations euh, de cette fameuse, euh, euh, je dirais, potion euh, qui est la COVID organique. Euh, après euh, euh, l'été où nous avons vu, au mois de juin, juillet, euh, une plus ou moins stabilisation et retombée des cas partout en Afrique. Nous avons vu, comme partout ailleurs, une remontée spectaculaire des cas à Madagascar qui a même poussé les autorités à remettre en place certaines mesures de restriction du mouvement des populations, comme nous l'avons vu dans le passé. En notre connaissance, Madagascar n'est pas réfractaire à la vaccination. Ils font bel et bien partie de, de, de l'initiative COVAX. Et dans la planification que nous avons au niveau de l'OMS, pour la distribution de des vaccins, Madagascar est bel et bien parmi les pays qui vont recevoir les vaccins à travers l'initiative COVAX. Maintenant, est-ce qu'il existe des sanctions pour les pays réfractaires La position de l'OMS a toujours été de dire que la vaccination ne doit pas être nécessairement imposée aux pays ou aux individus, mais notre réellement position a été de faire comprendre aux communautés, aux populations, aux États, les bienfaits de la vaccination, l'importance de, de se faire vaccination, de se faire vacciner. La décision d'imposer la vaccination de manière obligatoire ou pas, finalement, revient aux pays eux-mêmes. Ce n'est pas à l'OMS de prendre ces genres de décisions, ni à toute une autre organisation. Et jusque-là, la plupart des pays ont été, de manière largement concertée, euh, prêts à, 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 à lancer les campagnes de, 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 de vaccination. Donc, euh, c'est quelque chose d'extrêmement de, euh, important à souligner. Et euh, votre dernier point, c'était sur l'initiative. Vous pouvez un peu rappeler, euh, Khadija C'était sur le fait qu'on pourrait peut-être délocaliser la production. Ah oui, voilà. Alors, pour euh, la délocalisation, euh, effectivement, ça, c'est quelque chose d'assez important. Je ne l'ai pas peut-être souligné dans la partie anglophone de l'interview. Euh, il y a euh, le vaccin de Johnson Johnson qui est actuellement euh, en dernière phase d'essai clinique en Afrique du Sud, va être produit en Afrique du Sud. Donc l'Afrique du Sud vient de signer euh, avec la firme Johnson Johnson la possibilité, non pas la possibilité, elle vient de signer un, un, un partenariat pour la production du vaccin de Johnson Johnson au niveau de l'usine de, 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 de Aspen Pharmaceuticals qui se trouve au niveau de l'Afrique du Sud. Donc, nous commençons déjà à voir à cette délocalisation. Il y a également des discussions assez avancées au niveau du Maroc pour qu'une partie des vaccins de Sinopharm puisse également être produit au niveau local au Maroc. Mais je pense que de manière future, il est clair que la stratégie est de faire en sorte à ce que la capacité de production des vaccins au niveau africain soit augmentée pour que dans les pandémies futures, et personne ne souhaite ça, l'Afrique ait la capacité, effectivement, de réagir assez rapidement dans la production des vaccins en utilisant des solutions locales au niveau du continent. Voilà, merci, Dr Mihigo, c'était tout, et merci à tous les journalistes qui sont restés, et à vous, François. OK, merci, et à bientôt. Merci, docteur, au revoir. Au revoir.